this video is basically going to be your bible to using a router. Okay, in this video we're going to be going through four things that you really, really need to know about every time you switch on your router. Now I'm not going to spend any time going over what router bits can do and what router bits are available because if you're watching this you've probably already got a router and you kind of know what you want to do with it. But there are other videos on this channel that you may well want to look at. So maybe you've got a new router that you, you just want to be safe with. Or maybe you used your router once or twice and suddenly you think they're having a really noisy, really sharp, really fast spinny thing like this far from your face probably needs a little bit more thought going into it or maybe you know nothing about them at all or maybe you used your router you know once or twice and you thought I'm gonna to need to know a little bit more about this or maybe you know all there is to know and you're only here out of curiosity and to leave those technical comments down in the, the bit below which is fine we all know those people exist well good news because whether you're new not new or are you just sick of burning bits of wood? You're in the right place. And if you want to leave one of those comments, then as long as it's nice, I'll answer it. Now, even everything I've just said about sharp, spinny objects right next to your face is basically true. Quick caveat, there's nothing to be scared of. Cautious, respectful, considerate of, absolutely. So honestly, if you're new to routers, then do not panic. Quick caveat, well, just like any tool, uh, there is an inherent risk, but hopefully after this video, you will greatly reduce that risk. So it's not something to be scared of, particularly when you compare it to a table saw or a band saw or you know, a chainsaw. There's loads of really amazing things you can do with a router, and it can, with the exception of saws and sanders, pretty much replace or at least stand in for just about every other tool in a woodworking workshop. And there's even cordless ones now, so you don't even have to keep feeding the meter. Right, so what about these four rules? First thing we're gonna think about, direction of cut. Which way are we gonna move the router around our work? Now, if you're happy just to take my word for it, or maybe you're in your workshop and you just want the information so you can crack on, absolutely fine. You're gonna to wanna to go anti-clockwise around the outside of whatever it is you're working. Or clockwise if you're making some kind of hole or aperture. Maybe you're putting a letterbox in a door, or a window in a Wendy house, or a, a sink in a, a kitchen, or you're using some kind of template where it's got an aperture in it, then you'll wanna go clockwise around the inside of that. But if you're looking to really understand this to the absolute fullest, I recommend watching my longer video dedicated to explaining this in complete detail to get the absolute best out of both your project and your router. Router spindle speed or router bit speed? Okay, for some reason there seems to be a lot of information about that says if you wanna stop your router from burning the wood, then you slow the spindle speed down. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. The speeds that we're running at even at the very slowest speed settings that our routers are capable of achieving are more than enough to burn wood. Just ask any Boy Scout looking to get his wilderness campfire starting badge. Because it's the, the friction that we're, we're dealing with. And since friction is associated with the speed, I can see where this theory might have started. So if we move along quicker than that friction has got to build up, then we won't get to a point where the wood is under enough heat from friction to cause it to burn. So in order to do that, we need to keep our feed rate up. And we'll come back to this point in, in just a second. Now, in order to get a cleaner, finer finish, and hence a better project result, as any wood turner will tell you, to get that fine finish, we actually up our spindle speeds. And the same is true for the router. Now, in this case, it's not about running the router as fast as it'll go. It's about running the router bit as fast as it can go and that all depends on the size, the mass of router bit that's doing the cutting. Again, there's a much longer, more in-depth video that goes into all the detail about this and there it is linked in a card or whatever. But essentially as your cutter gets larger in diameter, you want to be slowing that speed down. Cutters up to about 20 millimeters, three quarters of an inch or so, can be running at around 28 to 24,000 RPM. Once the cutter gets to about the two to two and a half inch diameter window, they want to be in the larger, more powerful routers with half inch collets, 18 to 20,000 RPM. 
And once they get past two and a half inches in diameter, then only use them in a router table. And that's for safety and stability. And you're gonna be running those probably as slow as maybe 12,000 RPM. Now again, it's important to remember that this is kind of for guidance only, and there's lots of caveats surrounding where the shape, the profile of the cutter and the mass of metal that you've got. And again, video, all the detail you need. Um, but as far as this video is concerned, slow your cutters down, the bigger they get. And that was a piece of ice just falling off the window. So go, go check that video out, that's a, that's a good one. Depth of cut. Okay, so now our speeds are set and we know what direction we're heading off in, whether it's clockwise or anti-clockwise. We need to think about how much material we're gonna cut with each pass. And this is really more important than so many people give, give credit to. Not just from a safety aspect, but also the practical side the quality and the finish of our work. And if you're only gonna watch one of the detailed videos that I've already talked about, this is the one you should pick. But again, if you're in your workshop and you're screaming, get to the point, then just make your cuts in several passes and make sure you don't cut deeper than whatever the thinnest part of that cutter is. This could be a small or thin part of the cutting end, or it could be the shank of the cutter. But if you keep this mindset, you'll never break a bit, bend a shank, burn out your router's motor, and chances are you'll burn far less bits of wood and thus you'll spend less time sanding as well. You're welcome. Now I've deliberately not mentioned anything specific about what material we're cutting, hardwood, softwood, dense African exotics or man-made boards, all of which are gonna have their own characteristics and they're gonna react differently comparatively to each other. I mean, different parts of the same tree, the same species will act differently to each other. And this can sometimes cause unexpected results. So imagine what kind of complications we're gonna come across when we start to consider geometries of our cutter, different materials, and all of that. Suddenly the number of possible combinations and permutations just get pretty big. The detailed video covers all this without snapping your only dovetail cutter and burning all of that ingrain. Feed rate. This one really works in tandem with the last one. How fast we're moving our router around our work, whether it's clockwise or anti-clockwise. Now this is a tricky one to teach you as it's more of a tactile thing. So in order to really understand it, you need to be able to feel what's going on. And so as you're getting used to using your router and you're thinking about the first three rules and applications, you wanna start trying to think about how this all feels. If you're taking deeper cuts, it feels more difficult to cut than if you're taking shallower cuts. And if you're feeding clockwise around the outside with the direction of cut, it feels a le lot less controlled than if you're going against the direction of cut or, or anti-clockwise. And all these things start to build a kind of gut feeling as to what's going on. And that's really important. So essentially, the faster we move the router around, the higher our feed rate. And that gives the timber less time to allow friction to build up, and so less chance of burning the wood. Remember I already mentioned that when we are talking about depth of cut and all the rest of it. So with the cutter spinning at a speed that's suitable for its size, and a depth of cut to match, we get a particular amount of resistance that's caused by the material. The harder the material, the more the resistance. The bigger the cutter, the more the resistance because of surface area. And with these two factors combined, it means we can feed our router into a particular material at a particular speed. The slower it is, the more friction we get between the material and the cutter. If we get enough friction, we're gonna get burning. We can actually even get to the point where we're feeding the router into the material that it's a struggle so much that we start to strain the motor. So even if it's an expensive, high quality, brand new bit, it's also about hearing things as well. In the worst case, we not only start to unduly strain the motor, but the cutter as well, possibly to the point of failure. And actually, if the cutter's getting too hot, it's gonna dull quicker, and then that's gonna be more difficult to cut, and if we're taking too much of a bite, all these things combined, we're actually gonna prematurely dull the cutter, and we end up in this kind of vicious, vicious circle. Best case scenario, with the increased heat buildup, our router bits will dull significantly faster and become dirty with burn residue and resin and all that kind of stuff. This action compounds the issue caused by cutting too much, sending the risk of damaging whatever it is you're using soaring, and then the bottom falls out of your cut quality. 
So to increase our feed rate, we need to reduce our resistance from the wood. And the way we do that is we cut less and decrease the depth of cut, which brings us back to the thinnest part of the cutter rule that we referenced earlier. Now imagine we're cutting a really soft wood, a balsa for instance. We might be able to feed much faster with less resistance, even to the point where we can increase our depth of cut way past the thinnest part and still proceed faster. But we probably won't know just how much further we can take our cuts until we feel what's going on. And even with experience of various material types, as we've already discussed, there can be huge variations. Therefore, the thinnest part of the cutter is a really good place to start and make adjustments as required. So this is where we can start from with much less risk of burning the wood, burning out our router motors, or breaking expensive router bits. Five, the recipe. Yeah, I know I said four, but this is kind of an extra little tip just for you because you've stayed this far. So what you need to do now is think of these four, that's eight, four rules. Hopefully now you can see that these four aspects that we've looked at are implicitly linked. Therefore, if we think of them as a group rather than individuals, we can get best overall results for our projects. So in terms of efficiency of work, the longevity of our tools, the quality of our output. So in another video, we'll be talking about all of these rules and considerations and then mixing them up still further to the point that we can actually, by understanding each one and understanding them as a group, basically break certain rules at certain times. So for example, when to go clockwise on the outside without it being dangerous, or to reduce the speed of a cutter way beyond that which is kind of recommended dependent on the application or the material that we're using. So make sure you keep an eye out for that and also the other videos that I've already talked about.